Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I'm your host, Renee Bauer, and I am here with Jill Galata today, who is a registered dietitian, um, a divorce coach, and also has her own personal journey of divorce. So we're going to talk about all of the things today. Um, she and I actually connected through social media because she was really just doing awesome stuff in that space for empowering women to really like get through their divorce and come out the other side and doing it from a place of empowerment rather than a place of like being a victim. So um, I had to have her on because I love her vibe. And uh, so here she is. Welcome, Jill. Thank you so much for having me. And I love that description because that's truly what I'm passionate about is empowering women through this journey. It's such a challenging time and isolating and um you lose a sense of yourself. So I really am so passionate about empowering women to rebuild their lives and create this beautiful, amazing life that you can have after divorce. And that's like, that's the beauty of it too, is that when you're in it, I think it's really hard to see that you're going to come out in, this could be a place of beauty and opportunity. Like that's the last thing that you feel, but you've lived it, I've lived it. And we both know that that is the reality. So let's just start with like, what's your divorce story? It's so interesting because I literally posted about this yesterday because I, I always speak and I love that you just said that because when you're in it, it's so hard to hear it. And I never want to come out, come off as look at me. It's great and wonderful. And to the woman that is really knee deep in it. So it's so important that I'm relatable and I get it. And I get probably what I'm saying right now is not resonating because you don't believe it, but I so badly want you to believe it because there is an other side yeah. to it. Um, and I always say in my posts and you know, when I'm speaking to, to my ideal client, I get where you are. I felt everything you felt. And I had a woman DM me saying, well, can you share your divorce story? And I was like, oh man, have I not been transparent enough? So I did this whole post yesterday you know, you only get so many characters, the, the, the small snippet of my own story, um, which is I probably shouldn't have gotten married. I saw a lot of red flags prior to getting engaged, but my ex presented as a really great guy. So all these things that were red flags, I'm like, he'll get better at that. He won't mm -hmm. let this happen. Um, and I remember we had a lot of, we were having a lot of issues around money and honesty prior to getting engaged. We were trying to buy a house before we got engaged. He needed money for a work van. And there was little, little lies here and there. And I remember clear as day saying to him, you cannot do this. This is the reason people get divorced is money and lying, please. So when he proposed, my initial reaction was, I don't want this. Oh my God. And yeah. yet, yet the word yes came out of your mouth. And yet I said, yes, I wrote in my post. I was like a post for another time. Why I still said yes, yeah. but I really believed and he presented and he's a master manipulator. I realized that now that he would get better, that he would want to change. He'd be motivated to change. And I made every excuse in, in the book. So when we got married and everything that was an issue prior was a bigger issue in the marriage and everything as more responsibilities piled on to him, the lying increased. He, he started folding more and there was so much lying, especially around finances to the point that we almost lost our home. Um, he drained me of every, this is like going deep. So this I'm pu I'm putting it all out there right now. My <laughs> whole life. Um, drained me of everything I had in my savings. And I used to work on Wall Street. I come from a, a background where my dad was an accountant. I, I budget, I planned, I saved since I was like 10. This was not my world of like financial irresponsibility, bills not being paid. And what it ended up doing to me is I was living in a state of anxiety and stress all the time. I was waiting for the other shoe to drop all the time. And I became a really nasty version of myself. But still, even in all that, I held out hope, like this will change, he'll get better. Yeah. And I think towards the end, it was more so about losing this ideal of a family life, of that family unit of traditions and happiness. And I, my parents are still married. And I, at this point, I had two kids. And it was a really hard decision because I didn't want my kids to grow up in separate homes. Um, and I stopped looking at really what was happening in front of me. And I kept idealizing what I wished would, oh, I wish I would have. 
until finally, thank God, something clicked in me. And I just remember he lied about something else, like our house is on the line. He lied again. And I just said, I, I have to leave him. And I remember, I think the biggest switch for me, because the kids, I know the kids is a huge issue for people and it's a big barrier to leaving a marriage. I finally, it finally clicked to me, me staying is worse for my kids because yeah. what I am teaching them is that this behavior is okay. And I'm raising two little men. Like I cannot teach them and show them that this behavior is okay. And I finally, you know, after, I mean, it was four years of this, finally had the courage to leave. And the years that followed were awful. I stayed stuck for so long because I was holding on onto false hope. I was upset with losing that fantasy or that fairy tale ending or the ideal, not even him. I, it was, it was interesting. And I see this with a lot of my clients, you start to paint a picture of what really wasn't your marriage and right. that's what you're mourning and grieving and not letting go of. Um, so I did that for a, a few years and that's, that's a big motivator behind the work I'm doing. I do not want women staying stuck in all of that as long as I did. So what was the turning point for you from being stuck and kind of in the muck to saying, no more, I'm not doing this, I'm going to take control, or I'm going to start to um, just to shift how, how, where you were at? That's such a great question. Um, I think what it really was, I got tired of myself. Yeah. I got sick of this woe is me and this victim mentality. I was so unhealthy. I was, you know, 90 pounds soaking wet. I was drained all the time. I was tired all the time. I was unhappy all the time. And it was just this point of enough. I'm sick of feeling this way. And it was just that decision. I mean, I didn't decide that and all of a sudden everything was great and wonderful, but that was like the pivot into starting to put my energy and focus to getting to a better place, to stop sitting in, what was me? My life is over. I can't believe this happened to me. And really starting to shift in, okay, that shift that energy into what do I need to do to start rebuilding? I also think what was really important is I stopped recreating reality. I stopped expecting him to be different. I stopped expecting the situation to be different. I really started to accept, okay, this is your reality and what are you going to do with it? And so that was those two things were a big turning point for me. And you said that being stuck and going through this impacted your health too. So it goes beyond just what's happening inside. It's what's happening on the outside. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. So when I was in college, I had an eating disorder where I was heavily restricting, which at the time prior to, you know, changing careers and becoming a registered dietitian, I didn't realize it was all about control. And so my world felt very out of control when I was going through my divorce. So those behaviors came back tenfold. So I felt like, you know, the only thing I had control over is what my body looked like and what I ate. So if my body was this way, everything else externally is going to be better, which is not true at all. But at the time, that's the only thing I felt like I had control of. So I started, you know, engaging in those behaviors again. And obviously you're not eating. And so you have no energy and you have no emotional capacity when you have no energy. So my, my eating disorder perpetuated my inability to face what was happening and deal with all the emotions that I really needed to go through. Um, and until I really recognized that I was controlling that, I, did I really was I really able to start getting healthy again? And I really believe, you know, we look to change what we look like or control that because we feel out of control in every other aspect of what's happening as we go through divorce. But really your health is everything. So if you're not healthy or you don't have energy, you don't have energy to do all this work that you need to, to get yourself to a better place. You don't have the mental capacity or the emotional capacity to really get through all the challenging things that come with your divorce journey. So your health is so integral in you getting to a better place. I think that you said something uh, a few minutes ago that was really important. I want to circle back to was that you were the worst version of yourself in your marriage. And I, that really struck a chord with me because 
I had, I'm married three times. My second marriage was like a blip on the radar. Like it, it was so short, it barely existed, but I was my worst version of myself in that relationship. And I think that that's so important is that if that your partner is not helping you and encouraging you to be the best version, but the opposite, like that's really a sign or a red flag, like something's not working. So something has to happen, whether it's marriage counseling or leaving the marriage or whatever it is, but just that recognition that like this doesn't work and you don't want to live your whole life being the worst version of yourself. No, I think it's important that you take inventory of how you show up in these yeah. relationships. So, you know, part of my coaching is I have women look back on their marriage and how they showed up and what version of themselves showed up in that relationship. And mm -hmm what role did you play? And yeah. do you like that version of yourself? And I agree, that's a huge red flag. If you're existing in a space where you're the worst version of yourself, that's not a happy relationship and that's yeah. not a happy marriage. And I think it's important to really take inventory of that because of what I did, you recreate what that marriage was. I have so many clients who was like, I was happy and, and, and this is my dream life. And I'm like, but really let's look at it. Cause were you? Were you really happy and were you the best version of yourself? And I think it's important that you recognize how you show up in these relationships. And that's hard to do because mm -hmm. sometimes that's having that uncomfortable conversation with yourself and looking inside and kind of owning your own role in all of that. Absolutely. It's so, it's so hard to look in the mirror because it's yeah. so easy to point out words like you did this and mm -hmm. you did this. And I think, you know, given certain circumstances or whatever happened to unfold the marriage, like we don't want to take blame. Like I didn't right. do any of this. And right. so it's really hard to be like, no, you always, there's two people, regardless of your, if, whether your piece was 10% or 90%, there's always some part. And it's really hard to do yeah. to say, wait, this is, this is what I did in this. But I think it's important for your own growth. Even afterwards, yeah. it's important to see what role you did play because how do you want to change that going forward right 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 because you don't want to end up in the next relationship or marriage kind of on that same cycle and repeating that same pattern and that will happen if you don't face it and you don't deal with it and you don't heal it will absolutely show up again oh my god yeah we always repeat our patterns if we're not really yeah. taking a hard look at what we want to change and i think that's that's an important piece of you know healing after your divorce is really looking at how you showed up and what version showed up and what do you want to change? Right. So let's talk about co-parenting. You have, when you have a, uh, an ex who is really difficult, um, you still have to co-parent with them when you have kids. So how do you do that when there's still lingering feelings and some animosity and resentment? I think you have to remove those feelings when you're dealing with your, with the kids and they have to just be like the co-parent, like you're, you're still connected and your main priority are, are these kids and they don't deserve to feel any of the negative emotions that are between the two of you. Um, I saw a great quote, a meme or something that was like, the kids didn't decide to get divorced. Like you really just have to put that stuff aside when you're dealing with your kids, which is really hard. I mean, I had so much anger for so long that co for me personally, co-parenting doesn't exist because my ex is like a non-functioning adult and everything is on me, which for the longest time was a hard thing to recognize. But again, you accept the reality and that gets mm -hmm. you to a better place. But I think really just recognizing your kids are your priority and they, don't, they didn't choose this. So you have to show up in the best capacity possible and do what's best for them and take any of the emotion that's between the two adults right. out of it and make them, make them the priority. All right. So let's put aside the X and let's look forward. How can life after divorce really be a beautiful opportunity to recreate? And how does, how does someone um, who's in, in it right now actually believe that or take the step towards that? What, what do you, how do you work with your clients to help them create that? Um, I have a framework that I love to use. And I think it really starts with being realistic about what happened because we have to recognize this. If you're where you are at, it might've not been this dream life that you 
really made it out to be. So really taking a hard look at the reality of the marriage first, I think is so important in moving forward. And when you can see that clearly, you can start to see what you want differently. And then um, I have clients, you know, visualize what do they want for their life and dream big. What is it that you want? Because I think you really need something tangible to start implementing steps to move forward. So I think it starts with being realistic about what happened and what that looked like. What would you change or what would you do differently? Creating and visualizing what, what do you want to, your life to look like a year from now, five years from now, mm-hmm. 10 years from now? Because then it makes it tangible. Oh, I can be running a business if I want to. And I can have this loving, supportive partner that loves me for just me. Then that I think becomes the driver to doing the steps to get to this dream life and starting to believe that can happen. Like if you can visualize it, if you can dream it, there's the opportunity that can actually come true. And then it really becomes small steps, you know, reconnecting with who you are outside of this marriage. Mm -hmm. How do you identify as an individual? Who are you? What do you stand for? What do you enjoy doing? Really starting to and I call it like dating yourself because I think it's important to do that before you start dating. So a lot of digging in and learning about yourself again. Um, I use journaling as a tool for all of this. I think journaling is so impactful and insightful. And, and then just taking the steps to really move forward and create what you want and do it in a way where you're accepting your reality and you're starting to create your new reality. I love that so much because often clients will say when we're working out a parenting plan and they're really struggling with the, well, I'm going to miss having my child for that weekend or that night. And what am I supposed to do? And what an opportunity to do something that you have loved doing in the past and forgot about, or maybe something that you always wanted to do, like write the book, start the business, train for the marathon, whatever it is you for the maybe for the first time since you were a young adult have the space to do it now it doesn't mean you're not going to miss your kids like of course you are but you still do it anyway yeah and i think it's so important to it's like this rediscovery like remembering things that you used to love to do that you didn't have time or try i always encourage try new things try new things you might find things that you love and i think that transition of not having your, and that's something I struggled with. Like I was angry for a long time. Like I'm not going to get to see my kids every day now because of this. And now I live for my weekends alone. I (laughs) love them. And listen, that didn't come easily. Like it, it was definitely a transition and I still miss my kids when they go, but I love being an individual. I love reconnecting with other pieces of me that are not a mom. It's so amazing. It's empowering. It feels good. There's a strength behind that. The independence feels amazing. And quite honestly, I think it makes me a better mom. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I just saw that you weren't on vacation recently too. Like that's the other thing you can go on vacation. And I know like someone hearing this who's in the thick of it is like, no, that's the last thing I want to do. But that really becomes like a weekend away to recharge, to refresh, to like just recover and spend time like in peace and quiet is so beautiful. And I am with you, Jill. Like I love the time that I have, like it's, it's awesome. And of course I miss my son. Um, but it's still, it's like that those weekends, it's like, okay, how, what can I do? What do you know? What awesome things can I achieve this weekend? Or maybe I don't want to do anything and that's okay too. But the fact is like, you can carve out and make that time, whatever you want it to be. Oh, it's amazing to have that space for yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always talk to my clients, it takes some time to really utilize that time and not, and feel good about that time alone. I know for me, I, it was lonely at first. It was, Mm -hmm. what do I do with all this time? I'm supposed to be with my kids. I have no one else to hang out with. So you, you may not appreciate it now, but you will come to appreciate and recognize that appreciation takes time. But now I love my weekends. I, I pour into like little buckets. I talk about this, like have a social bucket. So I'll make a coffee date with a girlfriend, a productivity or work bucket. I'll do some work. Mm -hmm self-care time. I'll make sure I am exercising. So I have all these little buckets that I pour into and 
have an amazing weekend alone. And I'm yeah. like, this is great. Yeah. And it even gets better as the kids get older when they're teenagers. <laughs> like <laughs> you're like, it's like ping pong with the other parent. Like, no, you keep them. No, you, <laughs> cause your kids are a little bit younger, right? Yeah, my, I have a yeah. seven-year-old and soon to be six, and yeah. they literally operate at a level 100 at yeah. all times. So yeah. I fully need these weekends. Like, mm -hmm. they're just to recharge, like you said. And you get to just, I don't know, it's something so amazing about having that independence as just a, yeah. a woman. Like, you're not just a mom, and you get to have mm -hmm. these nice trips with your girlfriends yeah. and just... It's funny, I was away with another girlfriend and it was like, we saw this, who's also divorced, and we saw this family unit and we're like, oh, that's cute. And we're like, well, we're perfectly happy over here by ourselves. So you really do, you get to a place where you can have these great experiences. I love when clients reach back to me and I, I always have them and they're the woman who feel like I didn't want the divorce. Like my ex is disrupting our life and what it's supposed to be in the fairy tale and all of that. And then it usually takes about a year for them to reach back. And sometimes it's a call, sometimes it's an email and they, and they'll say their message is always the same. It's, I never thought that I could be this happy. Like I didn't even know that I was unhappy until now I'm excited experiencing the joy and freedom and what I have now. And like, that makes me cry. And that's kind of like why you do this work. And I do this work because when you're in it, it's so hard to really see that. But when you give yourself that time and space to heal and you stop looking back, you can really like your world opens up and there's just so much beauty out there. So much beauty. Oh my God. Those messages warm my heart. Like mm -hmm. even just hearing that for your clients, it's just amazing. And I think yeah. we both have experienced it. And I think that's why we're both so passionate about this work. Cause we know like there's so much more to life after this and you can be actually happier. Yeah. And I think that you made an important part. I think it's, you have to make the choice to turn the corner and, and work to rebuild because you can yeah. stay stuck. And that's, I don't want that for anybody. I think that's a big driver for me. Like you can stay stuck in everything that you're, you've lost or you thought you're losing, but you have this beautiful opportunity to make the choice to rebuild something that can be beautiful and amazing and better yeah. than what you were, what you were in. And I think, I think it's really important. I think to give these women hope. I felt hopeless at the time mm -hmm. when, and, and rightfully so it's one of the most challenging things that you'll experience in your life, but it's important to shed light on this. And it's important to give hope because this is a hundred percent possible. It's a hundred percent possible to create the life of your dreams after your divorce. How long does that take? Because this question I um, get, get asked a lot is how long does it take to start feeling good again? I think it really depends on your commitment to getting better. You can choose to stay stuck. Look, listen, I stayed stuck probably a good three years. I've been separated almost five. And I would say within the last two years, am I really truly living a life that I love? So I think it depends on the person. It depends on one, making the decision that I need this to be better. And then your commitment to that work, because it, it doesn't just happen. You know, you have to commit to rebuilding yourself and, you know, finding yourself again and getting yourself to a happier place. So I think it depends on the person and, and at what point you make the decision to commit to that work. But I think if you're committed to it, you know, six months to a year, if you're committed to that path and, and creating a life and putting your energy into moving forward, I think by a year, I think you can be in an amazing place. Would you do anything differently or did you, do you feel like you had to go through it the way you went through it to come out the way you did? I initially, like right when you asked that, I'm like, I would do it differently because I wouldn't stay stuck as long as I did. However, and it's even, and this is a testament to feeling in a better place. I am incredibly grateful for everything I went through because it's gotten to gotten me to exactly where I am today. So no, I don't think I would do it differently when I think about it because I feel blessed and grateful for my experience because it has led me here. It has given me strength and independence in a way that I'm not sure I would have had prior to that experience. And it has put me in a position to help other women 
And so I don't think if I hadn't gone through everything the way that I did, would I be able to coach women through this as effectively as I do now? Mm, I love that answer. And I, I, I hear you loud and clear because I had like two failed marriages and it was, you know, and, and if someone asked, do you have any regrets? My answer is no because for the same exact reason, those had to happen the way they did in order to do this work and be able to, you know, really speak from a place of like, I've been there, I've experienced it, I understand it completely. And now let's, let's help you get out of it. So absolutely. So how does someone work with you? Um, they can find me on Instagram at jill.galata. Um, and I'm actually, I'm doing, taking some one-on-one -on -one clients starting in, in January. Um, I have kind of a full load right now and everyone's the holidays and hopefully everyone can have a nice holiday season given Corona and all that fun stuff this year. But yeah, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching right now and I'm, I'm looking possibly to open up a group program next year in 2021. Awesome. And you know, there's so much, um, it, it's to work with someone like you before you kind of get stuck in the court process and litigation um, can really save you a ton of money. Um, it can save you a ton of aggravation um, and really help you come out of this quicker, um, cheaper and move, move on um, in, in a faster way. And I think that that's really like the, the benefit of divorce coaching is something that I feel like a lot of people don't know about. It's like, you're going through the divorce process, you need a lawyer and that's it. Well, lawyers won't help with everything that you're talking about. They're not going to help with mindset. They're not going to help you sort of get unstuck. They're going to be focused on, you know, what are your rights? What can you ask for? How do you divide property? And some lawyers do a better job of sort of a holistic approach than others, but to have a divorce coach, like on your team while you're going through this is just, I mean, you can't put a price tag on that. So it's such important work. I agree. I, and I, I said this to you before, I wish I had somebody like myself to help me through this process because I think I would have come out the other side much sooner and maybe have not spent so much on lawyers. But I think when you, and you said mindset, but I think the mindset as you go through this becomes so important. So if you're feeling supported and have the guidance of a divorce coach, all the logistical stuff and the legal stuff that yeah. you're going through is not as heavy and hard right. as it may be if you're not if you're going through this alone absolutely and that by not having someone there to kind of help you with all of that and if you, you start talking to friends uncles aunts who have gone through it and googling um and setting unreasonable expectations that's what drives you straight into a courtroom um, and no one is ever happy with the outcome. Like I'll have clients come to me and say, you know, what's your success rate? Well, if you want a divorce, my success rate's a hundred percent. But if you're looking for a success rate of like the outcome in court, you're not going to be happy because no one ever is. It's the judge's job isn't to make you happy. It's to divide things fairly. And I promise you that you're going to think what is fair um, is not the same uh, as the judge's definition of it. So the sooner you can kind of get out of the, the ickiness and the heaviness of your divorce, the better you are. So you can end up sitting in like your seat and sharing your story and, and really thriving. Yeah. And I think the sooner you can get through that stuff is then gives you the opportunity to rebuild and create a life that you love and get to this more positive, happy side. Awesome. So one final question, what, um, what would be one tip that you have for someone who's listening and who says, no, but you don't understand my ex is the absolute worst. Like I'm never going to get out of this. <laughs> what, I, can, what I can promise you mine might be worse. <laughs> Stop focusing on them it would be it, my, my number one and be realistic about who they are and really turn all your energy inward to you and start focusing on yourself and rebuilding you because that's what you can control. And once you're in a better place, dealing with them becomes less contentious and it's better for your kids. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jill. Such good stuff and so much, so many words of wisdom. Thank, Thank you, you for, for being having here. me. Thank you.